Our second reading this morning comes from Mark's Gospel from the 10th chapter. Let us listen together for God's word. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them, but it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Gracious God, still we prepare for your coming in Christ. Prepare our hearts, prepare our lives so that we might receive him, be changed by him, and follow him. In his name we pray. Amen. So for the last few weeks, we have spent time in different portions of the Christmas story, or at least the, the, the build up to the Christmas story. And now we are leaving it behind entirely, going into Mark's gospel. Mark tells us nothing about the Christmas story. There's no birth narrative in Mark. Nevertheless, in this passage, we find Jesus saying something that I think is very Christmassy. It's a story of James and John, two of Jesus' disciples. The text tells us that they are the sons of Zebedee, so we know that they're brothers. We learn elsewhere in the gospel that they are also called the sons of thunder, a couple sons of fishermen, probably very colorful characters with very colorful language, probably not too big on manners or politeness or, as we now know, tact. They present Jesus with quite the request. They go up to Jesus and they they come to him and uh, and James says, uh, Jesus, John and I were thinking, well, really it was John's idea, but we thought we'd come ask you, um, you know, if no one has asked you yet, we were thinking that maybe when, you know, when you're done and the glory and all of that, if the seats are available, I mean, if not, it's cool, but if they are, that maybe we could, we could sit there on your right And on your left, this crazy question, teacher, whatever you, uh, uh, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And Jesus has such a kind heart. He says, what is it that you want me to do for you? Every time I read this story, I find myself surprised, surprised that these disciples who've been following Jesus, learning from him, absorbing him, watching him, hearing him teach that they would confront him with this request. Not only do that, but, but you get the image of them walking along the road and the, the other ten disciples are right there behind them listening because we know they get angry when they find out what they've asked Jesus to do. Maybe they're angry because they didn't get to Jesus first with the same question. Or maybe they just can't believe these two brothers would say such a thing to Jesus. But I shouldn't be so surprised at what James and John ask of Jesus, at the the longing to be elevated above one's peers, at the wish to be honored in the public eye, the desire to, to bask in the glory of victory. Are there any impulses as human as these? You and I, we are colorful characters. We are sons and daughters of thunder and we are trying to follow Jesus. We are walking along this road and Jesus is ahead of us and we're trying to keep up. 
trying to understand, trying to absorb who this man is, where he is leading us, but we're also looking forward. We're looking ahead. We're looking beyond Jesus. Because Jesus looks sort of like a big mistake. It might look to the world as we follow Jesus that we have put all of our money on a losing horse. Yes, we know that this Jesus came as a helpless child to a poor family. We know that this Jesus lived a humble life. That Jesus, when given the opportunity, refused to defend himself, refused to take matters into his own hands. That Jesus died the humiliating death of a criminal. We know all of this, but we look past that embarrassment. We look past that shame. And we imagine as we follow Jesus along this road, we imagine that at the end of this road, there is going to be a great reversal, a great vindication, a great comeuppance, the greatest I told you so in all of history. Maybe we envision a rapture where we, the lucky ones, are evacuated from earth and the rest are left with trials and tribulations, which they probably deserve anyways. Or maybe, and more likely, we just envision a day when we will meet our Maker. And with joy, we will learn that our name is written in the book of life. And in the words of the hymn, with salvation's walls surrounded, thou may smile at all thy foes. From the comforts of our salvation, we can look at our foes and smile, knowing that we did choose the right horse. After all, it's that great I told you so moment. Never mind what looks ineffective or weak today because we know what's coming. We, we know what's at the end of that road. It's glory. And Jesus is going to lead us there. And we're going to join him there. So in the spirit of James and John, we approach Jesus. We come to Jesus with our request. Teacher, whatever we ask of you, do it for us. We ask Jesus for relevance. We ask Jesus for social standing, for significance, for recognition, for glory. We ask Jesus to give our perspective an honored place in our culture. We ask Jesus to restore to us a time when People listened to the church because we were the church to restore a time when people came to church because everyone came to church, when people gave to the church because it was expected. We ask Jesus when he comes into his glory to elevate us too, to glorify us too. A rising tide lifts all boats, Jesus. Glorify us when you come into your glory. And so the work of the Christian life becomes the glory of our cause, elevating us, elevating our cause, the Christian cause, which of course translates into the glory of Christians, of us. So like James and John, we go to Jesus and we ask him our question. And Jesus answers, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave at all. And then Jesus reaches into his bag and he pulls out his Santa hat and he puts it on and he tells them the meaning of Christmas. He says, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, this is Jesus' lecture to his disciples, his disciples who have been following him all this time. He's probably frustrated that they haven't caught on yet, but we know that they still haven't caught on after this story. It will take a long time, just as it takes a long time for us. When Jesus says these words, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, it puts us at a crossroads as his followers. It forces us to ask the question, how do we understand Jesus? How do we think of why he came? Which gets us back to the story of Christmas. Do we take Jesus' words seriously, all this business about becoming a servant or a slave? Or is that just more of this weakness, this embarrassment that we're willing to look past until our great reward at the end of the road? If we think Jesus is leading us to that great reversal, that great I told you so moment, the vindication of us and 
hours. And we're not likely to take all this service talk seriously. You know the classic joke, why did the chicken cross the road? Punchline, of course, is to get to the other side. And the reason that's funny, you're not laughing because you've heard it so many times, <laughs> but the reason that it's funny is it turns on a, a, an answer that is implicit in the question, why did the chicken cross the road? We don't need to answer to get to the other side. Tell us more. Tell us what the chicken was after. What was on the other side of the road that was so interesting? We don't need to make explicit what is implicit in the question. So I wonder when we ask the question, why did Jesus come? If there's something implicit in that question that we have overlooked. When I first came to this church, we had a relationship with a, an IT company in the, in the area. And when we would have trouble with our computers, we would call and they would say, uh, open up this program that was installed on all of our computers and we'd open it up and, and like magic, suddenly the mouse would be moving without our, uh, our, our touching it, the, the you know, windows would pop up and typing, it would go so fast um, and we would just sit and watch as uh, this, this uh, IT person would troubleshoot our issue from all the way over in Commerce or wherever he was. Um, he could, on our computers here in Milford, he could, he could troubleshoot and solve our problem, whether it was a virus or simply overloaded with software, whatever it might have been. We often talk about God's plan of salvation at this time of year, the plan of salvation that culminates in the coming of Jesus to be among us. And when we talk about that, we often speak of it as if God could not do it without sending Jesus. That sending Jesus was an essential Heart, that there was no other way for God to do it. But I think that's selling God short. Don't you think that a powerful God could, all the way from commerce, could log in and just remove the viruses and sort things out and reboot the software? Couldn't God do all that remotely? Did God have to send Jesus? Did God have to come and be among us? Is God uh, not powerful enough to do it from far away? Why did Jesus come? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Why did Jesus come? It wasn't to conquer Rome. We know that. It wasn't to uh, start in motion uh, a sort of trap that ultimately would lead some to this great vindication and the rest to something much worse. We know Jesus didn't come to bestow glory upon his followers. And Jesus didn't come because God wasn't able to, to, to fix the problem from far away. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus came because that's who God is. Jesus came because that's who God is. I want that to sink in for just a moment. Jesus didn't come because that was God's winning strategy, that that was the, the tool, the device that was going to uh, flip the switch on this problem of human sin. It wasn't God's strategy. God didn't send Jesus because theologians tell us that God had to send Jesus. God sent Jesus because that's who God is. It is God's nature to come. It is God's nature to arrive, God's nature to enter in God's nature to serve, to give. That is who God is. Jesus came because that's who God is. Jesus came to do the work of God, the work of giving, the work of serving, the work of entering into this life, this broken and dark world. Jesus came to enter in because that's who God is is God does not stand off at a distance. God enters in, God participates, God feels, God experiences, God becomes, God enters in. Jesus came to usher in a new work for God's people, for, for the followers of Jesus. And this work is not the pursuit of glory, not the pursuit of recognition or honor, not the pursuit of a dominant place in our culture for Christianity, but the work of giving, the work of serving, 
the work of entering in to the life of this world, this broken and dark world. <clears throat> All this time later, it is still so tempting to confuse the meaning of Jesus' ministry with our own desires, our own impulses, that very natural, very human impulse to pursue glory and recognition like James and John. The sons of thunder. Christmas comes to us as an annual reminder to us, sons and daughters of thunder, us colorful characters. Christmas comes as a reminder to us, a reminder of why Jesus came serve and to give. A reminder of the work that God calls us to in Christ to serve and to give. And a reminder of why. Because that is who God is. Let us pray. God, you have entered this world. Enter our hearts as well. Shape us after the example of your Son who entered into the brokenness of this world. Send us out into the brokenness of our community to serve and to give in his name. Amen.